I'm going to teach you the proper way to run a Section 8 rental property. This is your show. This is the show where I work for you directly, taking your needs. I'm going through the MLS, and I'm trying to find the best possible deal for you guys. Put down 25%. That's the perfect way to buy this. That's why real estate investing is the greatest industry in the world. Welcome to the show. Today, I want to teach you how to do low-income Section 8 rental property management, right? The way you manage and operate these types of investments is different than how you would manage or operate others, right? And specifically, the client I'm talking to today is an investor. Uh, his name is George. George, you are from Long Beach, California, right? And then the property that you're going to be looking at with me today is in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio, low-income Section 8. I can't think of anything that is more similar to Long Beach, California than some freaking low-income Section 8 rental in Cleveland. Am I right? Uh, oh, oh, no. Oh, you mean those two areas, they're not the same? No. No, they ain't the same, folks. They're very, very different. But luckily for you, George, I'm an expert. In low-income Section 8 rental property management in Cleveland, over $200 million in sales, largest portfolio of its kind in the Cleveland market, bro. And I'm going to help you, right, analyze this deal. I think this duplex would be a great investment for you, right? This is what you're trying to get into. You're trying to get into these low-cost properties. Low prices, high rents. That's what it's all about. But more importantly than that, I want to teach you how we manage these why we manage them the way they do, how they're going to make you money, how they're going to lose you money. I want to get your uh, head just wrapped around exactly what I'm thinking, right? Because I think everybody in the world, when they see a property they can pick up for like 100 grand, and then it's like a 1.5% price to rent ratio, right? 1,500 in rent. People are like, wow, those numbers are really, really good. They're doing the back of the napkin math. They're doing the 50% rule. They're like, dude, those numbers are great. But you have to understand why these properties are how they are. Yes, they make money, but I want you to understand how, why, see the risks, see how we manage them, see the decisions we make. So let's break down this property I think you should buy, but I don't want you to buy it until you let me tell you everything I know about it, the good, the bad, the ugly. Let's get into that right after this. Hey, Steve. What are you doing? Oh, nothing. Just saving money on my rental property insurance. Oh my, Steve. Take me now. Holton Wise. Real estate investing made easy. Wow, I'm so glad I clicked that link below. Welcome back. Let's pull back the layers of low income investing, right? Let's pull back the layers on what it's truly like to be the owner of this low income rental property here. 2100 Fern, Cleveland, 4 for 109. 77 days on the market, right? That's a little long in the Cleveland market. You got to move quick in the Cleveland market. You want to take down deals. Often you don't see properties listed for that many days. Why? Why is this one like that? It's price too much, man. 115 grand. That's what the seller wants. It's not worth 115 grand. Now, there's nothing wrong with this thing per se, uh, but it's not worth 115. I believe 105 is the right price point, okay? Now, this neighborhood, right? I'll pull it up on the map actually real quick for you, all right? Let's pull this bad boy up right here, okay? This neighborhood is what I like to call a D grade neighborhood, okay? D-grade, you're dealing with low-income folks, but this is my favorite D-grade neighborhood in the whole Cleveland market, okay? Because this right here, this, this is Metro Health, all right? This is the house, Metro Health. Metro Health is a big, big old hospital, huge employer, right? They're investing a billion dollars into that campus that I just circled on the screen and the surrounding neighborhood, okay? So this property is going to benefit from that, right? Billion dollar investment happening right here, okay? Billion dollars. So right now, it's going to perform like pretty much all the other D-grade neighborhoods, right? I have something that's called the Ultimate Guide to Grading Cleveland Neighborhoods. I have linked it in the show notes below, right? You could also just Google it. You can go to HoltonWise.com. Uh, it's in the Tools and Resources tab, right? Three easy ways for you guys to get that. I graded all neighborhoods on an A to F scale. F, 
Cheapest price is highest level of risk, highest level of crime. A, most expensive uh, prices, lowest level of crime, lowest level of risk, right? This is a D neighborhood. There's a lot of D neighborhoods in Cleveland. It's going to perform just like all of those, right? But looking down the road, I think if you're close to a billion-dollar investment, if there's 25 D neighborhoods, I'm going to pick the one that's got a freaking billion dollars coming into it. I don't know about you, but that's what I'm going to do, right? So I like it for that perspective, right? And as far as what it's currently like to run a D-grade property, right? Cash paying tenants, you could put them in there, but I prefer to go Section 8, right? You see this property, you see the overgrowth, right? The yard, it doesn't look amazing. And you know what? It's not sexy to be a D-grade uh, real estate investor, okay? It's not. Like stuff like this in the driveway, weeds in the driveway, like that is just common for the neighborhood, right? Uh, it's an older home. Here's some photos that the listing agent popped up there. This is prior to them putting a tenant in there. They do have two tenants in there, okay? Two tenants are already in there. This is like when they're rehabbing. You can see the painter's tape right here. I do like the color schemes that we went, they went with here, the gray, the white. They did nice with the hardwoods. I didn't really love the kitchen, but it is what it is, right? It's going to rent. They're currently bringing in twelve fifty a month. They didn't say exactly what they're bringing in each unit. I'm guessing they just split that, right, like six and a quarter. But in all reality, these are $750 units, right? So... I think it's worth 105, not 115. They need to come down 10k in price for this to make sense for the buyer, right? 1500 comes in, 18,000 for the year. After calculating your fixed variable uh, expense estimates, fixed and variable, right? That's 9,356 on average. I think you're going to make, right? We got to talk about that. What do I mean by that, right? Well, if you see, I got repairs, vacancy, capex. I got 900 for each of those, right? That doesn't mean every year you spend 900, right? Repairs and maintenance. I think a lot of investors think that those just like happen like monthly. They really don't. Once you get people in there, there's really not that many repairs you need to do as a landlord. Every once in a while, you'll have to do this or do that. But most of the time, it's pretty low key, pretty easy, right? The majority of your repair and maintenance money comes at turnover, right? Turnovers are bad, right? When you get turnovers, especially in the low income neighborhoods, the units are gross. They're dirty. Shit's broken. There's holes in the walls, right? You got to like refresh them, right? Like cabinet doors, they fuck them, right? They get, they get fucked up, right? Like... You living in your house, your fancy suburb, you probably never broke a fucking cabinet door, right? But guess what? Motherfuckers in D-grade neighborhoods, it's like fucking sport for them, dude. They break them sons of bitches. I don't know how or why, but they fucking do. That's the game, dog. That's what you signed up for. Woo! 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 That's part of D-grade investing, right? That's why you get those fancy price to rent ratios, right? Because the level of risk on these properties is high. The level of difficulty dealing with them is high, which lowers the price, right? If investors aren't being paid for all the BS, they just ain't going to deal with it, right? So that's part of the business, okay? So most of that repair and maintenance money is going to come at them turnovers, right? And then vacancy and non-payment, right? Sometimes you get turnovers because the tenants move out, normal vacancy. Sometimes you get turnovers because they stop paying rent. You got to evict them, sons of bitches. Part of the game, right? And then CapEx, that's your big ticket items, your furnaces, your hot water tanks, your roofs. This property, mid to end of life. You ain't getting a property for like 100K with everything new. I, I think investors, they hear a lot of stuff about like turnkey this or turnkey that. There's no like big turnkey player in the whole uh, in the Cleveland market, right? Like we are. Holton Wise is the big turnkey player and we're not even a turnkey company if we're looking at turnkey as a traditionally turnkey company, right? Turnkey. Turnkey is really just a fucking marketing term, okay? But like a traditional true turnkey company, they take an asset, they buy the asset, they completely renovate it. They put brand new tenants in, and then they sell it to you, usually at an inflated price. That's how the turnkey business works, right? They would have to buy the assets so cheap and in such a terrible position that they could sell it to you, making like $20,000 on it, right? So if that was like our model, there wouldn't be any way you could pick a property like this up for like hundred grand, You just couldn't do it, right? You'd have to be uh, much, much higher. But you'd be overpaying, right? So Holton Wise, what we do is we provide investors the turnkey experience, right? But we don't buy the property first and then sell it to you. No, no, we work with you as your broker to get you actually at or below market value deals, not higher than market value deals, right? Because you got to buy it right. That's how you make money in the first place, okay? Can't just go overpaying for properties, folks. So because of that, you don't see properties like this with all brand new mechanicals that don't make no goddamn sense. If I'm the owner of this property, which I'm not, but if I was, 
I got a roof. Maybe my roof's got five years of life left in it, right? It's probably a $7,000 roof on this property, right? It's supposed to last about 30 years. Well, if I'm 25 years in, why would I drop seven grand? I got five years of life left, right? My furnaces, they last about 30 years. They cost three grand a pop. You know when you replace a furnace, folks? When it stops working. You don't ever fucking replace a working furnace. Same with a hot water tank. They cost a grand. They last 15 years. You don't go, duh, that furnace works. That hot water tank works. Let's spend a bunch of money getting rid of them. That's not what, like, normal human beings would do, right? So a lot of investors, I think they get confused, right? And then they see these properties and they're like, oh, well, the furnace isn't new. The hot water tank isn't new. They must need to reduce the price because of that. No, dude. That's why the price is what it is, right? That's how it works, okay? And that's why we calculate your capital expenditures in your budget, right? So those 900, all three of those line items, if you have tenants in there, which we currently do, and they're paying, which they currently are, and the mechanicals are working, which they currently are, that's not real money. You're not actually spending that money, right? That 900, 900, 900 actually goes on top of that NOI that I got estimated for you, right? But I don't want you to just think of it as profit because eventually you're going to have to spend it, right? And it's not going to come in the form of a $900 bill. It's going to come in the form of a $3,000 furnace, a $7,000 roof, a $5,000 turnover, a $2,000 eviction. You catch my drift? You got to save that money, right? So with all that, right, now you have a good outlook on what it's like. You should be able to project out a 21% cash on cash return at this property with the tenants paying market rent. We got to get them up about a buck and a quarter. But you don't want to just go a buck and a quarter up to 750 when you first take this thing over. You don't want to do that because that'll create turnover. Artificial turnover, that'll kill you, right? That's where the majority of those turnover costs come from. You want to keep these tenants in this property as long as you possibly can, right? So I would go up slowly, right? Resign them to a one-year lease. They're currently on month-to-month -month leases right now. Resign them to a one-year lease. You want to make sure you do that because if we go to evict them, right? Let me get paint you a little scenario, okay? Here's a scenario. You buy the house. They're on a month-to-month -month lease. The very first month, they don't pay you. We file an eviction. We go to court. They say, oh, I didn't know. The new dude bought the house. I sent my money to the old dude. The judge is going to go, oh, is the old dude here to testify? They're going to go, no. He's going to go, okay. This case is going to be delayed for two weeks so we can get his testimony, okay? We're going to eventually win because they're making that up, right? But what's going to happen is you're going to pay again because we have to go to court twice instead of once, right? So what you want to do is make sure we get them on a new lease. The easiest, quickest, best way to do that is to say, hey, man, your rent's going to stay the same. I ain't upping it. Here's a new 12-month lease. Now, if they don't pay, we could easily evict them, right? And because you kept the rent the same, they're not nervous. They're not ready to jump ship because if you try to give them a new lease with a huge rent increase, they're probably going to want to move out. Then you're dropping money on the turnover, right? So you keep them in there for a full year. Then I recommend you go slowly, right? Keeping your occupancy up is the best thing you could do in these degrade neighborhoods. And then to reduce further issues with vacancy and non-payment, those $900 estimates, you want to aim for Section 8 tenants when you get a natural turnover. These two are not Section 8 tenants, but they are good paying tenants. But not all tenants are good paying tenants, right? So when we're screening new tenants, because we can't do anything with these people, they're already in there, but they prove to be good, right? When we screen for new tenants, we're going to take the tenants that have the least likely chance of not paying us rent and those are section 8 tenants because their rent is guaranteed by the government right and you already got to do a refresh on the unit because you're going new tenants so we're going to bang it out make it look beautiful and get that market rent that's 750 that is how you profitably operate a low income property that is the best way to do it if you do it that way my team will handle all the dirty work make this a cash flow machine for you Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.